I, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Benedict Lowe. Uh, Dr. Benedict Lowe is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Physics, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. With a strong interest in the material and catalysis, Dr. Lowe's research group has been focusing on the fundamental aspect of uh, synalytics and morph material and their catalytic application. Uh, today, he will give us an interesting talk regarding operando X-ray diffraction, a study of oxide derived uh, copper-based cat uh, catalyst for ECO2 R R. Yeah, let's pass time to Dr. Low. Okay, thank you very much. Now interrupt your screen. Okay, you can share your screen now. Okay, is it working? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for coming to today's session and thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you very much to, um, Peter for your um, nice introduction. And obviously, um, your introduction on my research area is on silicic and morph material. And I'm trying to expand my interest into some other uh, model reaction and catalytic reaction as well. In this case, it is um, the CO2 reduction reaction, electrocatalytic. So my topic today is operando X-ray diffraction study of oxide derived copper-based catalysts for ECO2RR. And Right, um, so some of the re major, my research major focus is the structure reactivity correlations. Um, why it is important as, as you might already have learned from um, Dr. Ju and also from Dr. Um, Lin in this morning. Um, it is very important to provide the necessity details for the identification of chemical trends. Um, let me use my curves. Uh, where's spotlight? Is it working? Uh, no. Um, how to select a point? I'm sorry. Um, maybe I'll you can just use your cursor, your, okay. your mouse cursor, then people can see. Okay, it's working. Okay, okay. Um, so to provide necessity details for um, the identification of chemical trends and also some benchmark quantum sciences like chemical change and physical changes sort of things, and then you can also we can also correlate the structural properties with respect with the physical and chemical properties, which is very important. And then ultimately, we always want to say this, we can guide rational preparation more functional and other materials with better um, catalytic properties, mainly because I'm, I'm mainly a catalysis person. Okay, why is it not working? Right, um, so why do we need um, operando techniques? Um, there are a lot of operando institute techniques, depending on how you call them, uh, how you define operando institute. I'll go into this in the detail, like TM, like Dr. G has um, talked about, Raman, FTIR, XRD, um, XPS, all this type of technique. It is important to do operando in situ to capture the information continuously, nonstop, because there are um, some metastable species during reactions. I'll go into this in more detail. And to disclose the surface reconstruction processes. And very importantly, um, surface reconstruction is a very fast, um, uh, uh, it, it needs to be captured in real time. So it's very difficult to be captured with ex situ technique. So that is why we need operando techniques. And also very importantly, to reveal the real active sites of different catalytic species. Um, some recent examples are um, revealed examples are people want to develop different operando techniques or institute techniques. Even better, if we can build a reactor, uh, a real um, reactor for characterization. So for example, we can do everything in the same at the same time. Like we can do um, XLD, we can do um, XF, we can do XPS with the same holder. So we can have more coherent and information. Um, but this is obviously, this is a goal, and which is quite difficult to be, to, to be achieved because um, each um, characterization technique has different um, sample requirements and also with a, a reactor cell uh, uh, requirements. For example, um, like TEM, you want a flat, pay, uh, flat holder for um, Raman, maybe you want a uh, um, different holder, for example. Um, so it is quite difficult to do, design a comprehensive cell that we can do everything at the same time. And this little example is um, beamline um, BL36XU in spring 8. So it says it can provide time resolved QSAT using um, this undulator beam and also um, can do XAF imaging and XES and also time resolved um, QSAT XLD and ambient pressure XA, XPES and ping beam experiments under in situ experimental conditions. 
And on the right hand side, we can see how it, how complicated it is and how difficult it is to design um, the, the operandal or institutional um, environment. And on the bottom left, you can see how complicated and how, how packed it is. Um, so on the top bottom right, it is a, a little illustration of um, the type of experiments that can be done. Um, like they can measure different um, measurements at the same time or at different time with the same reactor cell, which is um, very handy. Because when you consider you want to do an um, operando experiments or in situ experiments, you need to go to different places to do all the operando studies. But it is very important because um, to, to do it at the same place because um, you want the same environment to be kept. Um, like what I just said, um, it is quite easily um, the, the reaction condition can be changed. For example, um, the temperature, the pressure um, with different solution. Um, this type of um, parameters. So it is very important that we want to design something um, that can be done on the same, on the same place. So a little background of my research. Um, I've been working on silicon and morph materials on the rational design and on the structural reactivity uh, properties. Um, all right. So as I know, there are quite a lot of um, students here. I just want to explain um, the difference between in situ versus operando. Um, these are, uh, sorry, the operando should be italic as well. Um, these are some quite often um, misused wordings. Um, they are different, to be honest. Okay, taking this electrocatalytic CO2 reduction reaction over copper as an example. In situ, uh, something characterization means, for example, um, this XLD measurements while heating the samples or when it is soaking in electrolyte. But it is not necessarily related to catalysis. And operando means it has to be under operating conditions of catalysis. So for example, under applied voltage with CO2 flowing. So in this case, for example, without CO2 flowing, it is not operando, it is in situ. So quite importantly that you, you should you should use the right wording to describe the right thing. And I, I, I've been reviewing papers. It has been quite often misused and even in published paper because it is quite a vague concept that you should um, address on. So technically, they are not interchangeable, but operando can be considered as a subgroup of in situ technique. So um, it is one of the in situ technique, but it is um, even more superior than an in situ technique, and it can better reflect what is happening during the reaction. So why would we need in situ characterization? Um, the profiles can be quite different. For example, in this example in uh, by Liu et al. Um, so in this platinum tin um, catalyst. Uh, under in situ uh, or quasi in situ measurements, you can see um, it the, the the PT tin contact is quite different between um, the in situ measurement and the ex situ measurement. So it is very important to do in situ measurement or say even operando measurement to tell exactly what is happening during catalysis or during reaction. Um, ex situ characterization does not always tell us the real picture of what's going on, regardless of how well you protect the sample because I'm going to show you an example in a minute. So uh, a recent example in collaboration with Professor Daniel Lau is uh, we have been working on this nickel selenide, NISE2 uh, for um, HGR reaction, electrocatalytic HGR. And as you know, um, under uh, operating conditions, so we need to apply voltage. And obviously we know under apply voltage, it tends to uh, reduce. So NISE2 is, should not be the real active catalyst because it, it is going to reduce at some point. So the active catalyst or the say active species was found to be um, nickel selenide, NISE, by operando synchrotron X-ray powder diffraction. So we did this operando con um, measurement to tell under this specific catalytic performance, um, the actual um, catalyst, what it actually is. Instead of NISE2, at the real catalytic time, it is NISE instead of NISE2. And we can tell from um, the change uh, from the Bragg speaks from um, XLD pattern. And you can see that uh, this is the cell that we designed um, with this cell, sample cell here. And it is done by a transmission mode. So X ray beam go all the way through this uh, sample cell. And then it, uh, the diffraction pattern is detected by the 2D uh, detector. Um, it can be done um, in synchrotron because of uh, this highly high brilliance X-ray beam, um, and it can penetrate through um, some sort of electrolyte. And it is 
but however, it is only limited to um, synchrotron X-ray beam. You cannot do such a transmission experiment with solution in a typical lab source machine because of um, the absorption. Even in synchrotron, it took us um, more than a year to make and design and optimize this um, operando cell. Uh, we experienced a lot of technical, uh, technical difficulties. For example, initially we designed uh, with, uh, I think one centimeter thick electrolyte um, layer. But this one cm thick electrolyte layer absorbed a lot, a lot of X-ray. So we essentially saw nothing from the X-ray pattern. And ultimately we needed to design a 0 0.2 um, centimeter layer um, uh, electrolyte layer um, to reduce the X-ray absorption. And you know, for, for this type of reaction, we always want to have, um, for example, one molar um, electrolyte. But this one molar electrolyte is highly X-ray absorbing as well. So on the day that we were doing our experiment, we need to reduce, we need to dilute our electrolyte to um, I think 0 0.05 molar in order to reduce the absorption. So it is quite different from what you're expecting. And it is it really takes a lot of um, trial and error to optimize um, what's going on. And especially in this type of um, institution, say synchrotron, um, it, the, the, the beam time is highly valuable. And you can only apply for like two or four days in a year. So you really need to treasure your time there and do as much experiment you need to do. It's unlike um, the instrument in our, our own university where we can just use it anytime that we want. So it is quite different. And we um, it's quite stressful when you're talking about this cell. Um, so a little bit about the science. Um, the current R&D trend, um, a lot of people are working on this CO2 conversion theme. And my model reaction here is I want to study um, this CO2 to ethylene, which is studied by a lot of people. And the oxide derived uh, copper based materials are well known to be a promising um, candidate because um, copper intrinsically um, is known to uh, favor CC coupling. But an interesting question here that I have put in brackets is the structural chemical stability of this um, catalyst. Sometimes these catalysts were even reported as stable and remain unchanged for multiple hours under the electrochemical environment. This made me feeling um, quite, um, don't really understand what is happening because um, copper oxide or copper one oxide is known to be uh, under electrocatalytic condition, it should reduce. But uh, in some report, in some paper, even in Jackson and Angle One Tech, we often see that people are talking about, okay, it can last forever multiple hours, 10 or 20 hours, unchanged in structure from XRD and from uh, different characterizations. So this is quite puzzling me, to be honest. So this is why I am doing this um, project. And yeah, like here, what do you expect to see copper or um, copper, two, copper one oxide for um, CO2 reduction after multiple hours? So according to this Paul Bay diagram, it, it, has, it has to reduce regardless what pH you're using. So it has to reduce to copper, right? Um, basic chemistry. And in terms of um, XF, uh, you, if you are doing a characterization, we should be expecting to see at least the CC bond, uh, copper copper bonding instead of um, all copper oxide bonding um, in the XF. But um, in our own measurement, so we took this XF data of cubic um, copper oxide, copper one oxide. And the sample itself was already sealed in N2 after our catalytic reaction. But we only observed um, copper oxide scattering path and in with the absence of any um, copper copper interactions. So basically it says only we can observe copper oxide phase only, but without any metallic phase. So which is quite strange. And the limitations in using this type of uh, ex situ or even pseudo in situ technique um, because of this, maybe because of this metastable sub nanometric mm -hmm. copper ox, copper zero species, uh, which can readily Reoxidize in air, which makes um, this characterization quite difficult to achieve. Um, so there are different um, studies, for example, um, with this copper oxide with different morphologies. Um, this this paper by Law et al. Um, so they said um, with a special uh, morphology, they can achieve really high e uh, uh, Faraday efficiency up to seventy percent or something. And in this Nature Energy paper um, on different surveys you can see different um, absorption energy so given that copper one oxide to some extent would reduce to form copper zero what is really going on here so uh we we, we utilize um this uh, morphology study of copper oxide because we know um, there are different surface energy so leading to they should have different um reduction uh, uh, reduction potential or electrical potential so 
uh, we made octahedrons, cubes and nanowires. And um, so, right, um, they're of comparable um, particle size, roughly 400 nanometer. And this nanowire, roughly 50 nanometer, seven micron in length. So they're comparable. So in this um, time resolved um, catalytic measurement of AECO2 RR um, of only carbon, uh, carbon products, we can see that in octahedral, it re it's relatively stable, uh, up and down slightly within experimental area for two hours. But in this um, cubic and even nanowire, uh, I can't find a nicer cartoon of nanowire, or better representative of uh, nanowire. You can see that um, the, the, the Fe to F line really decreases over time. And even for this one, we can't see any F line at all. Um, and what is happening here? And um, so we adopted this multimodal or parental characterization because um, it ultimately is a nanoparticle. So we need to um, see what is happening. And we, are, we use um, powder X-ray diffraction, which is a bulk technique so we can see the whole thing. And also we use this micro Raman spectroscopy, which is a surface technique. And the penetration depth uh, is roughly tens of nanometer for uh, copper one oxide with a laser or a green laser. So first, we designed uh, in situ, uh, sorry, in-house gas flow cell, uh, which took us more than a year to design and optimize and um, to get rid of all the technical difficulty. So we really have substantial difficulty as we cannot use a transmission cell in lab depthometers. So here we need to use a, uh, a reflection cell. So uh, like this illustration um, above. Um, so. Uh, you know, um, there are a lot of commercial cells available, but with this type of flowing cell, uh, we can't find any um, commercially available ones. And this is uh, designed by Professor Chiu Tan from Diamond. And the whole cell is quite clever. It's mostly 3D printed. And again, uh, it took a long time to optimize. And we have been doing this experiment in PolyU in UMF. And what is happening here is we measure the operandal um, diffraction measurements. Uh, you can see um, the first one is um, octahedron. The second one is nanocubes, and the third one is Y, A, B, C. And you can see they, they behave differently. For example, in this octahedral one, you can still see quite a substantial bit of part of um, copper one oxide after two hours. But for um, this nano Y, you can see basically it disappear after 30 minutes. So you can see um, clearly fast so, uh, copper one oxide phase can still be observed after two hours in this octahedral one. And in this cubic one, it is somewhere in between so we did a little quantitative study by the refer method. So you can see how um, it is changing from one to each other. And um, I'm quite sure this um, copper to copper one oxide ratio graph is quite difficult to understand. But what you can expect to see is basically you, after two hours, it's all copper for um, the nano wire sample, but it's only 20, 25% for this octahedral sample. And, we want to explain a little bit on why we want to do um, operando study. And from this ex situ study, um, it looked like operando still uh, because we, we, we did it uh, kind of pseudo ex situ. And we just took all the samples at different points and we can still plot a nice um, three dimensional or color contour map. But you can see a clear difference in the operando diffraction profiles where um, you can see the formation of copper one oxide here um, at roughly 18 degree and at an earlier time in this operando study, but not definitely not in the ex situ one, where you can basically see the formation hit in this part uh, after 90 minutes. All right, um, so besides um, the bulk technique that we use, uh, that is um, powder diffraction, we also use this uh, micro Raman spectroscopy, which is done in uh, UCEA. So we built this um, operando cell for uh, the CO2 reduction reaction. So basically we, we observe the same thing. Um, even on the surface, you see this nano Y sample. Um, this is after two hours and uh, over time. And you can see basically it, it disappears after um, two, three minutes even. And for this cubic one, it disappears after one hour, this copper oxide peak. And for the octahedral one, you can, you can see this um, copper oxide peaks even after two hours. So basically they, cons they are consistent with each other. So which means that um, even with both bulk technique and with both uh, bulk, bulk and surface technique, we basically see the same thing. That is a much more stable octahedral copper oxide phase in the octahedral um, copper oxide, and uh, which may favor 
uh, better, uh, which may provide a better configuration for CC coupling to uh, C2 products. Um, so this is a little schematic of uh, our proposed mechanism. That is, um, uh, for, from SEM, as, as I said, we observed the particle size is probably 400 nanometer. And from XLD, we can derive the domain size, uh, which is different from the parent particle size that is observed from SEM or TEM, um, which means that uh, there are multiple octahedrons forming one octahedron in this case. So we see um, roughly 70 nanometer. So um, combining with our operando techniques, we can see that the, the gradual formation of um, in 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. So gradually they are uh, spreading out. Um, so in a sense, we are having uh, this uh, cartoon profile. And for um, the cubic one, it is something like this that we are proposing. O obviously it is cartoon. It is not exactly what is happening, more like that we can see in uh, Operando TEM. Uh, and the background color is um, how we can see that it, it now is sta stable, the Fe of Ethylene and also as well as the Fe of H2. And but in this case, in the cubic case, we can see a decrease in ethylene, but a, a similar increase in the Fe of H2. So this is the structural reactivity correlation that have drawn uh, from our observations. And what is what is pro, uh, uh, what can be happening here is we read from this paper from um, Goldart, uh, Free et al. Uh, in peanuts. So it said, they said it is the coexistence of the stable copper and copper one oxide phase, which provide a synergy between the active surface of um, copper one and copper zero, which enhances CO2 um, activation and the dimerization of um, this copper one intermediate uh, to promote C2 formation. So um, it essentially explain why we have observed um, this structure, structure versus uh, reactivity pattern. And I think um, it is quite a, interesting um, observation because um, what we observed is quite different from what has been proposed in the past uh, or what has been often proposed in some literature that is the copper oxide or copper one oxide uh, remains stable over time and I was quite am amused with this observation and I'm trying to um, figure out uh, what is happening behind and how it is related to the catalytic reactivity and Yep, this is more or less um, our findings, our recent findings. And so a little acknowledgement, that is, I want to give it to uh, my student, Zhang Hao, and also Professor Chiu Tan from Diamond for the design of Reactor Cell. And these are uh, my financial support. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, you, are, you are ahead of schedule, yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, quite tall fast. Uh, Quite fast. Yeah. Uh, any any question from the audience? So take your time, yeah. Take a chance. Again, yeah. If you are not too shy to open your microphone, then you can you know type your question in the, in the chat box. Maybe I start with uh, the first question. Yeah, please. So so. Uh, the idea uh, sounds very challenging. You, you you try to capture something moving, is it? The uh, whole idea of, of a something that can be reoxidized or something that is metastable. Metastable. So I, I would like to know what, what sort of the time frame you're you're looking. Time at. frame is not that fast. It is mainly because of um, that we are under applied voltage uh, throughout the whole thing instead of we are taking it out. Uh, we are stopped, we are not quenched, because uh, when you talk about quenching experiment, uh, it really down to how well quenched the sample is, right? Okay. But in this type of solution experiment, it is quite difficult to be quenched. Uh, so when you take your electrode out from the solution, it can already be uh, re-oxidized quite rapidly because we, we, we try to uh, take out the uh, electrode, the carbon uh, paper from our electro uh, electrolyte. And we can immediately see the color change from um, copper back to copper oxide. So, so, so it is quite rapid. You're not, you're not trying to monitoring the whole process? Uh, no. They, no. They just look at the, the effect before and after, right? Uh, during. During. Yeah. 
So that's why I, I, I'm asking the time frame. Because the time frame, I, I, the time frame I, I, for um, we, we Brahman is roughly detector. 10 seconds. It's not that fast. 10 seconds, okay. Yeah. We, work, we work with a detector. Like the detector have a uh, respond time like nanosecond, femtosecond. Uh, no, not that, not that oh, time frame. It's not, 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 not femtosecond. Yeah, minutes or even seconds. Or, or minutes, second. Okay, that, that, that's not, uh, not too bad then. So for monitoring the flow rate, then you have to keep uh, the gas flow in and out, right? Yeah, 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 and it's quite important that you you are calibrating everything um, because um, in this, like what I just said in our um, operando XLD cell, right? Um, it, it is not exactly the cell that you would expect in your um, say Excel reactor inside your laboratory. So it is quite different because now we have one service on the top, okay, one open service on the top, and but in a normal Excel, you should have your whole um, uh, 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 electrode in the solution, right? Yeah. So it's quite different. So we, we need to consider everything and calibrate everything. And we try to explain um, to the best out of our understanding. So in some slide you have mentioned that you're using a single joint source, but yeah, yeah. Uh, now what happened that you, you're using other source? Uh, yeah, we can still use the synchrotron source. It's just that we are trying to develop our in-house um, operando measurements because um, synchrotron, it, it, it really is time, either both time consuming and too valuable. So in this case, when if we are developing our own operando technique, we can just do it any time that we want to give us more information. But you, you, you want to do it in polyurethane, then you don't have a synchrotron, right? So what, what sort of uh, source you use instead? Uh, it's just a typical lab machine. I mean the light source, the, 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 what sort of light source you're using? Uh, this is molybdenum, molybdenum X-ray. Oh, X-ray, X-ray source. Yeah. Okay, I see. Okay, uh, any other question from the audience? I saw a question from the chat box. Yep. How we can remain the oxide stage during the operandal test or practical operation in CO2RR? Um, the oxide is quite stable. The copper one oxide is quite stable. So if you, even if you put it in air for multiple hours, it is unchanged. Even for days, it's unchanged. So copper one oxide or copper oxide is very stable. But the metal stable, uh, what is metal stable is the um, electrochemically reduced um, nano, uh, nano copper, metallic copper is what is the unstable thing. Um, can I... Have I answered your question uh, to be why? Yeah, we, we have a break in between, so uh, so don't hesitate if you're coming. Thank you very much. Question. Yeah. So if oh, if hi, you... but I I have another question um, regarding your uh, your comparison between the in situ and the ex situ XRD. Yes. Uh, I can't help noticing that uh, the operando uh, data, uh, the peak seems to be quite broad compared to the ex situ. So uh, because I, I you never mean this seen... one? No, no, no. That's the previous one. That you just, uh, previous. Uh, one. Yeah, yeah, this one. You can you can see for the ex situ, you can clearly see the splitting of the the lines, but for the operando one, you seem to just see all the broad peaks. Yeah, because um, we also have the effect of electrolyte as well, because ultimately it's in solution. So we observe uh, um, uh, not as good as um, the ex situ one because um, it is just a dry surface. But in the operando one, we have electrolyte somewhere and all we have all the interference. So right. definitely the, temp the, the, the data resolution is worse than um, the ex situ measurement because, okay, ex situ, you can just do any time and dry environments. Yeah, uh, so because my understanding on the X-ray is uh, uh, so uh, so this kind of uh, other uh, like impurity they could uh, uh, cause a background. So yes, will that yes. also affect the peak width of the like this uh, this it, phase? It, it, it will not affect the peak width. It will not affect the peak width. Okay. Yeah. It will just appear as different phases. For example, uh, with a higher background or with different crystalline phases. Mm, okay. Um, so like, like what you are doing is what we are trying to observe the change rather than um, the actual uh, what it is because we, uh, the, the resolution is always the problem here is that we cannot really tell um, precisely what it is, but we want to see um, how the change is related to the catalytic properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
thank you. Um, Yan Ping, you got a question. In the SI nickel selenite case, the transmission mode may collect information from the bulk. Is there a possibility that the surface has been reduced to metallic nickel as the catalyst is mostly on the surface of the material? Um, here. Um, in a sense, as you know, um, XRE is a bulk technique. So essentially it is observing everything um, of your catalyst on the carbon paper. So if you have uh, still say 80% nickel selenite and 20% nickel, you, you will be able to see 20% nickel and 80% nickel selenite from the XRD. Um, uh, let me show you the XRD pattern briefly here. So for example, here you can see the, um, not necessarily say nickel, we did not see nickel um, during our electrocatalytic measurement. We can see um, the concentration of both from uh, refinement. So we can, from this peak uh, intensity, from the whole pattern refinement, we can tell the difference between the two in the uh, bulk phase rather than um, only the surface. Because we, uh, from XRD, you know, we cannot um, just do the surface besides uh, like uh, small angle scattering or surveys enhance diffraction. Um, can I answer your question? Oh, thank you very much. Okay, any other question? If not, then uh, uh, we can have an early break and we, we assume our uh, uh, section around half fee. Okay, thank you very much. So the chair will be me in the next session. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter.